Our next panel is uh, going to talk about NFTs from around the world, right? It's not just happening in New York, the United States. It's happening all over the world. It's happening in Nigeria. It's happening in India. It's happening in Antigua. Let's give them the big hand. Quack, quack, everybody. What's up? Hello. Hello, guys. All right, my name is Zach Hadid. I'm representing the Days Ducks. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit about a few different topics on how our projects and our brands have impacted uh, our regions and what we believe the future of NFTs and, and cryptocurrency looks like in those regions. Very good. My name is Charles Mbata. I'm one of the co-founders of Niger NFT community. Um, it's a very thriving um, NFT community um, in Africa, Nigeria, West Africa. So. Uh, we're going to be speaking about um, some of the uh, impacts of uh, NFT in that, from that region and Africa in general as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Priyank. Uh, I'm from India, Mumbai. We were India's first and white only NFT project. And as the conversation has taken speed, we are now uh, you know, taking creators from the space of music, art, and working with brands and taking them into the metaverse out of India. So, you know, uh, just to set the context on behalf of the panel, uh, I think if you were going to a regular conference that's been happening for decades and you are at a session that will talk about impact, I think you'll see a lot of graphs and presentations in terms of, you know, the numbers. Here, I think largely we are here to talk about what the potential of the impact is and, and how uh, our NFT projects have been able to influence and affect communities. So I think, uh, Charles, why don't you take it up in terms of what you've been doing uh, in Nigeria? Sure. So um, getting into the space, uh, um, early last year, I quickly realized the, the importance of having um, a community, um, building a community for people in, in Nigeria, artists, creators in Nigeria. Um, and that's what, we, what, that's what we did. So in talking to them uh, during um, Twitter, Twitter spaces and meetings, we, we quickly realized that the NFT is really changing lives over there. Um, you know, and something really powerful is happening in the sense that artists and creators back there are able to now tell their story you know, straight from the horse's mouth. And we're, it's not from a lens of a Western media or any other media, but they actually live in the culture, they're actually able to tell their story. And these stories are minted on the blockchain, so that's something really powerful historically. So um, it, it's, apart from the economical benefits of it, but just being able to you know, tell their story um, from, on the blockchain is something really powerful that, that we're witnessing. So yeah, that's one of the um, great impacts that we're seeing, and um, you know, we, we, we like that. So yeah, we, we'll dive into a bit more later. I like that you brought up culture, you know, because I think the three of us come from regions that are really, really rich in culture. Myself from the Caribbean, yourself from Nigeria, India uh, as well. You know, we all have different um, aspects of our culture that I think our art and even just our creators in general from that region want to be able to showcase to the globe. And that was something that we were looking at uh, with Days Ducks. My originating team were all from Antigua and Barbuda, a small little island, population of 90,000 persons. We've all known each other all our lives and kind of been entrepreneurial in different sectors and different industries. Our artist is, you know, that's his paying salary as an artist. He's got his own little shop and we've always kind of looked up to him um, growing up as kids. He's a little bit older than us as a bit of a legend. So when the NFT space started to gain traction, we saw it as an opportunity to do two things. Uh, one, obviously, give him the opportunity to showcase his art to a global audience, which is very hard to do from a small island, as well as onboard our community into the crypto and NFT space, because there's quite a bit of skepticism. And I think uh, the, three, the three of us will agree that in each of our region, there's skeptics uh, regarding, you know, the, the future of NFTs, the legitimacy, how it can be used, and, and even, I know from experience, we're so underbanked that just even trusting their money in, in something that is digital that could be gone tomorrow, it was hard for them to grasp. So we used you know, our NFT collection, as well as putting our, our reputations on the line, fully doxed, reaching out to our inner communities there on the island or in the region, saying this is an opportunity to, to kind of see what this technology can do and, and the potential for you guys as creators as well. 
not just consumers. Oh, exactly. So I think if, if we were to speak about the barriers to entry per se, uh, we had a very uphill task in India. Uh, my co-founder and I, our last day job was in the music festivals, live events business, uh, having gotten shows like U2, Cirque du Soleil, the NBA India games down. Uh, and, you know, uh, pandemic hit and we were on Clubhouse understanding what this entire space is about and it was a Eureka moment and we went to all our uh, buddies in the music world and said, let's do NFTs. And they were straight up like, oh, it's illegal. Because, because the central bank did not allow the regulated banks to deal with crypto exchanges, the larger notion was this is something illegal, right? So even before the government of India uh, kind of took cognizance of you know, cryptocurrencies exist, uh, we saw that at least crypto exchanges were doing some business, so we assembled a battery of uh, lawyers and tax experts to kind of do presentations to the established creators to prove to them that this is indeed nothing illegal and, you know, we are here to safeguard their IP, safeguard what they are creating. And, you know, this, this journey itself from where uh, we were able to give creators in India uh, access to another revenue stream apart from their existing revenue streams was amazing because, you know, in terms of creative talent, it's, it's always uh, very fragmented how you can actually make the release when it comes to music's, uh, music. Uh, the labels are controlling most of the business in terms of art. Uh, there are the galleries and uh, the auction houses. But at times, how much stuff they can get out base, is based on their capacity. And it's not really the market as we know because of NFTs is, you know. I agree. I think, uh, and you guys can add to this, I think a lot of people in our region are looking to leaders in the space, or at least those that are willing to take the risk and kind of innovate and, and set that precedent, blaze that trail and say, hey guys, this is the potential. We'll show you how we can use this, and then hopefully you get inspired to do something similar. I think you guys would agree down in your Absol regions. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, so something else that you know, you know, I really want to bring to the limelight as well, with regards to Nigeria, in particular, is because the um, uh, you know at, the cryptocurrency is banned in, in Nigeria. So, and at some point, Twitter was actually banned in Nigeria last year, which which is um, you know drives me crazy. But it goes to the extent to show some of the uh, huddles and barriers um, creators from that region of the country 100%. have to go through to kind of put work out there and be able to support themselves. And it's really something powerful that a, a kid in the slums without electricity could create work and someone in the UK would admire it and buy it. It's something very powerful without the, um, the, the auction houses like the Sotheby's and all that. So, you know, the blockchain brought about that possibility and it's something powerful that's really changing lives over there. Like, there are lots of artists that are really doing very well just, you know, based off of the um, NFT. And something else I wanted to touch on, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, con co it's a, it's a country, um, uh, yeah. so the African NFT community started off, but now what we're seeing is um, a Nigerian NFT community, Ghanaian NFT community, Kenyan NFT community. So, these countries, the same in the Caribbean. Yeah, so these countries are, are kind of fractionali fractionalizing and, and self-governing, but we, what we anticipate something powerful is going to happen in the near future is like these countries, this community NFTs will come together to build something powerful and it, it, it would make a very powerful impact in the space. So it's something that we're, we're really some of us are already talking about it and planning about it in the near future, but it's something really exciting that is going on that you know, I want to share with you guys. There's something really powerful going on there. Thank you. No, absolutely. Like, if, you, if you see from the Indian perspective, the 1.4 billion people, 38% of them have access to smartphone. And here uh, at this conference, all of us have seen the kind of development that's taking place in this space. And, and maybe even before the next NFT NYC next year, we'll see a much uh, better UI in terms of accessing these NFTs. What, what that will automatically do is, uh, you know, when the numbers come in, you'll, you'll hear there are 25 or 30 million uh, crypto accounts in India. But they, these are essentially the numbers in terms of users of crypto exchanges, which do not really have the wallets, right? And it's a metric on the, on the sheet uh, for the crypto exchanges. And they are, most of them were $1.5 worth of free Bitcoin was an onboarding technique. 
Now, let's say the top 10 or 20 percent of them, if they're able to make the move to NFTs much more easily, I think the 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 impact that that can have is unreal. Like you know, stuff like play to earn, cheapest data in the world. You know, the possibilities are endless, in my opinion. I, I think we were touching on two underlying topics here, which are yeah. like accessibility first, and also regulation. Um, and I would hate to go down the rabbit hole of talking about regulation, so I'll start kind of on accessibility in at least in Antigua or from the Caribbean. A lot of us um, here in, in the States or around the world, Europe, for instance, we're used to interacting with NFT collections through things like Discord and Twitter and Telegram. But in some regions in the world, the, these are not the main uh, mediums of communication. Uh, the communities aren't as engaged with them. I can tell you in Antigua, they're way more traditional. Facebook and Instagram are typically where you'll find them. Um, and WhatsApp is a huge component as well. So the way that we're actually communicating in these regions about what we're trying to do as a project or brand um, definitely changes how they access you know, or interact with what we're doing. And we need to make that a little bit more seamless. Um, I spoke about how in our region, at least, they're very skeptical with trusting uh, crypto or exchanges, but also they know that it's very difficult to access these. When we were coming up to our mint, like day of mint, I was getting friends calling me like, hey, can I buy Solana from you in cash so that I can uh, mint one of your NFTs? Just because they've been trying all week long to use their Antiguan bank accounts to get into exchanges. And it was just too many loopholes to go through. Even the KYC process, they don't recognize our identification cards and things like that. And that touches right on regulation as well. Um, because they're trying to purchase these cryptocurrencies on centralized exchanges that have regulatory rules that they have to abide by. And it just becomes too much of a difficult task. And until we break that barrier down, I think all of us will agree that our regions are going to struggle to mass adopt this tech. Absolutely, absolutely. And some of the things we've done actively to kind of help uh, combat that or alleviate that, that barrier is um, we are every month or every quarter we try to organize a physical in real life in Lagos, Nigeria um, on onboarding session for them and you know we use that, that opportunity to you know because they, they, they would prefer to see someone and talk to someone. The Twitter spaces, the clubhouses are fine but they, they feel more comfortable when they can sit with someone and explain you know, some of these nuances to them and be able to say, hey, click here and click here. You'll be able to you know, create a MetaMask wallet in, in, in a couple of minutes. So having that physical, real life experience really helps um, kind of break down some of those barriers, the skepticism that we face here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the next project that we are working on is Salute. So it's, it's a beverage, ready to ring beverage brand out of India. But what we are doing essentially is kind of looking at some of the finest uh, projects globally and tying down those utilities to tokens that are being minted in India. Because uh, till now, we are still looking at JPEGs and an animations moving around with whatever little action that's being seen in India. The idea is to give the depth of what the possibility is within the space to the users there for them to be able to access, see, believe, and have some real world utilities to it as well. And just touching uh, on the point that uh, Zach made, in terms of regulation, like the government of India doesn't even recognize what NFTs are. They barely, like a few months back, understood and classified cryptocurrencies and start taxing those. Uh, but they have absolutely no understanding. Uh, so everything that's happening right now is, uh, you know, self-calculation. We are assuming certain tax brackets, paying tax towards that. So I think in terms of adoption, of course, uh, attempts are being made by the community, being supported by the community, but I think uh, like governments all over the world uh, took a lot of time with things like shared riding, etc. They'll take some time with this revolution as well. Yeah, I find in a lot of uh, the first world communities, you know, the audience finds a way to interact with these NFT communities and find a way to get what they want. But I think we'll all agree in our regions, it's not really like that. They're not as enthusiastic as moving forward. Um, yeah, we had a great mint with our project, and the majority of some of our holders still remain in Antigua and the Caribbean. But for instance, our, our US or European holders come into our Discord and, and say, you know, where are all these other holders from the Caribbean? They're not going to be in there interacting with it because that's not how they, they engage with these sort of brands online. And, and definitely, like I was saying earlier, changing that a little bit will allow us to make a, a, have a greater impact in our region because there is 
talent there, um, not just in the Absolutely. artist standpoint. You know, we know that there are um, tech guys that are capable of coding in a, in a manner that maybe isn't available elsewhere in the world. Like in your region, India, you guys have great human resources. In the Caribbean, we've got a lot of artists, a lot of creatives that are trying to find a way to get, you know, their message out, whether they're an actual artist or a musician or, you know, even just a, a graphic designer or have an entrepreneurial idea that they want to integrate this tech with. And then they find that barrier of, you know, okay, setting up the infrastructure, um, educating their audience about it. It, it just ends up t making the process a little bit too longer or frustrating for them that they don't even consider it. You know, I'm often preaching to my friends that have businesses how they can use NFTs to help their business or brand, and they, they often turn around and the expense, the labor costs, the time, you know, even just their understanding of it, it, it's still a bit of a turnoff. And I was saying earlier, like, good tech is tech you can't see, and we need to be, uh, you know, aiming for that with NFTs as well. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Nigerian creators would appreciate regulation, but what we get is absolute ban. So, you know, we, we, are, we are hoping to get, you know, enough support and be formidable enough to approach the government and, and, and explain some of the use cases, some of the benefits of, the, uh, of NFTs, so whereby at least we could get to a stage where we're having conversations about, about regulations and not complete outright ban. So, um, you know, We'll, you know, it's, it's something that we're hoping to get to in the near future, but, it, you know, we would appreciate some type of, some type of support from, from the community and to get to that stage where we're negotiating a regulation and not an outright ban, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. I think uh, we've discussed this previously also. All of our projects were based on the need uh, and, you know, lifetime understanding of the fact that there needs to be a better way. Uh, art and creativity is so deeply rooted in the Indian culture, and, and there are so many uh, handicrafts, artisans, who have no other option but to kind of just set up in their villages outside their houses and just wait for somebody to drive by. And, and what we're seeing here is kind of the potential of this is so huge and, and so cross-border so easily. Uh, and I think we'll have to give it out to the community that projects uh, from these, uh, you know, smaller markets are being given this kind of a stage here at NFT NYC. And thank you guys uh, also for attending. But, uh, you know, the potential is unlimited. What do you think, Zach? I honestly think there's also something that needs to address the, the kind of perception of this space. A lot of people are still coming into this space, even from our regions, to make money. And they think they're going to make astronomical amounts of money, 100x, you know, whatever they are. And I often, the first thing I tell anybody that I'm speaking to, you shouldn't be playing with any funds in this space that are paying your bills, your utilities, etc. That's not what this is. This is so Sorry. early. We don't know what it's going to look like. So don't put your life savings in it. It's not a money-making opportunity. It is an opportunity to develop this tech into something that we can all use in the future for the better. And maybe just even inspire you know, the right person to make that shift and showcase even to our governments, I think, that there is a demand amongst Absolutely. the people in the masses to use this tech in so many different ways. The more that we can keep innovating with it for, from that standpoint versus thinking, oh, how are we going to make all this money and then suddenly extract the value from the space? Uh, even at our level in, in third world countries or small communities, it, it needs to be changing that perception already. Absolutely. And I think it also makes for a good representation of the art industry in general. Because um, now that we're, the blockchain is giving, um, uh, NFC is giving an opportunity for those uh, underrepresented artists to be on the, on, on, on the scene, you know, the, the arts ecosystem, it's, it's going to be well represented. So uh, on, from a larger perspective, that's also some of the benefits I see, you know, having the, the, what the NFT kind of develop, um, brings about. It's, you know, having a more inclusive um, uh, arts ecosystem, well represented art ecosystem. No, absolutely. That's, that's the journey even we have seen in India uh, with all the creators that we work with. So when we went to them, uh, nobody in the traditional uh, monetization terms was asking them for NFTs or Web3 rights. So, you know, it, it, it was just a line added to the contract saying that, you know, if it was a sale of a track or sale of an EP, 
that you know this does not include any NFT rights, etc. So earlier the labels were all okay with it. In the last six months, everybody has been trying to get back, and everybody wants a piece of the action. Nobody really has plans as to what they'll do with it. So you know th this was a recent case last month. Uh, a big label out of India want, uh, wanted to one of our music acts uh, NFTs right take it over. What we told the creator is just to ask a simple question: What is their plan around NFTs? And if there's none then you, know, you should not be missing out on the opportunity. So we've seen that uh, entire process of educating the creators first, uh, you know, educating the uh, customers second. There's still FAQs on our website as to how to go and get the MetaMask, et cetera, which, which doesn't happen in markets like these where you already expect people to know how to transact and connect a wallet. Right, so I think that these are the challenges that we, we still have to kind of overcome, and we are rapidly overcoming it with, with the kind of the community helping in. Agreed. I think uh, also, you know, just making sure that we don't end up pigeonholing that perception, like I was saying, like even the fact that NFTs aren't just for artists, they can be for anybody that's looking to do something within their brand or their business. There's a lot more potential to that. We're now seeing a lot of people talking about putting leases and, and housing deeds on as NFTs, ticketing for events as NFTs. These are things that can easily take place in our, our countries where right now that process is super convoluted, takes way longer than it's supposed to, and not as seamless as it should be. So, you know, I think in the Caribbean, we party a lot. If, if we were to be able to set the event, the uh, precedent that NFTs are something you could do ticketing with, you know, you can also kind of offer to your attendees, kind of create some sort of loyalty program. I know Vitalik is talking about these soul bound NFTs as well that he thinks are the future, but we're kind of already doing that in a sense here. And, and just making sure we don't get pigeonholed into NFTs only being about one thing. Because I hear often in my community, like, oh, NFTs are either a scam or it's just for artists. Absolutely. And I'm trying to change that by showing, look, I'm putting my neck on the line. All of our, our founders are putting our neck on the lines. We're re we have reputations. We're fully doxxed. We're trying to come across and show you guys what the potential is behind this tech. And we need this in every, every region, I think. Absolutely. Um, for, for us, it's, it's, uh, you know, our community is fast adopting. It's beyond arts and collectibles, um, right, right, like you pointed out, Zach. Um, so we, you know, we are very, we have a lot of a vibrant, energetic, young Nigerian youths that are venturing into play to earn games now, fashion, we're, we're very vibrant with fashion. So um, a few of our community members are really leading some, some high fashion NFT projects now. So, uh, you know, some restaurants and clubs are actually adopting NF, um, uh, blockchain technology, NFTs as well. So it's beyond arts and collectible for us, and you know, we we're one of the top trading um, uh, cryptocurrency trading countries in the world, and so we already we've already accepted the technology. It's it's just more of like you know having the government be on our side and letting uh, the creators create. So that's all we're asking for. Just let the creators do what they do best and support us. So it's beyond arts and collectibles for us. It's, it's way more where we're venturing into everything that, that blockchain provides, and we're really excited about that. Yeah, even in India, you know, uh, there were a lot of uh, brands that just came in for one drop and disappeared after that. So this time when a brand approached us and asked for guidance, what we did was we actually went into the ethos of what they do. They do on-ground parties, they do music releases on Spotify, etc. They're distilleries based out of UK. So we've actually tied together all these real-world possibilities to the NFT rather than just focusing on some art and this, then looking out for an art collector to enjoy. A, and it's not really about what the brand represents. So, you know, so that's what we're doing. It's, it sounds a lot like we just need to be able to, to have our voice heard. Absolutely. And, and, you know, be able to be involved. And, and the more people we get involved in the space, the bigger this impact is going to be across the globe. We're, we're still super early. And, you know, I, I really appreciate everybody that was here listening tonight uh, to our topic. Um, we believe we're a pretty good representation of some yeah. underserved regions and markets across the globe in this space. And, and we're here representing those regions to you guys. So any questions you'll have for us, I think you can reach out directly to any of us. I'll, I'll start. Uh, I handle the Days Ducks Twitter handle, Instagram, as well as all our marketing. You can reach out daysducks.com, that's our actual collection, or you can find me on LinkedIn as well as Twitter, Zach Hadid, and feel free to continue the conversation. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Charles Mbata um, here on behalf of Niger DAO, Nigerian NFT community. 
I'm also working on the Player to Earn game called Bionic Owls. Check it out. But um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions um, that arise. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Priyank Mahajan and Token Runway, both of them are on Twitter. Looking forward to hearing from you guys and connecting over your project and ours. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs>